Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Stories That Inspire Us. Today is Friday, June the 24th, and oh my gosh, I'm getting so better with my dates and times. Thank you, Lord. Today, we are here with an amazing guest, and you know, a lot of us have heard, or let me back up a little bit, a lot of us have know someone who's perhaps in our immediate family or has a friend know someone that has dementia. And here we, today we are going to chat with our amazing guest, Carolyn Burrell. Carolyn, thank you so much for being here today with stories that inspire us. I've been binge watching your podcast and I love your concept. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. You know, as a lot of us often do, we have someone in our family or we know of someone that has dementia or the onset of dementia. And your story is no, perhaps no different than anyone else's. However, it's very unique on how you walked that path. And you are the author, by the way, of Walking with Faye, a memoir about dementia. Wow. Obviously, I, I know that Faye is your mom. Tell us a little bit about your mom, because I think that is so important for this discussion. That's a that's the first question I've ever had like that. My mom, my mom was salt of the earth. She she raised three kids, uh, stay at home mom mostly. My dad was a plumber. So she had to make, you know, all the ends meet. And she was very good at it. She instilled, I think in all three of us, a, a, a strong sense of uh, frugality and work ethic, honesty, I think. Uh, you know, went to church every Sunday, that kind of thing. Um, she, was, she was the matriarch of the family for sure, uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, dinners at five, as soon as dad pulled in the driveway, we were having dinner, everybody was at the table, it was expected. and. I would just say that I had probably the best upbringing. Um, I laugh about all the little things, you know, when we get together with friends and you laugh and you say, oh yeah, my mom, <laughs> my mom would have lived like that or whatever. But I love how I have, I love how I've turned out as an adult from her, from her upbringing. You know, I just got the chills when you said that, because I had a feeling or I had a sense that along with being the matriarch of the family, like she, as you stated, the salt of the earth, but she was the cement that glued everyone together. And I also sense that she had an amazing um, personality, very outgoing and a sense of humor that maybe no one gave her enough credit for. She never met a stranger and, you know, it didn't matter where we were, we would be chatting with someone. So yeah, for sure. She was, she was an outgoing individual with a quick, quick wit. And, and I, and I, I just remember those, those parts of her. That's beautiful. And that's, what's important as well too. And as life goes on, you went about with your life and then you ended up moving back to be closer to your mom when you found out about her diagnosis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, what, what happened was, is I started, oh, I started noticing things, honestly, more than a year before I actually took action. And I was in Idaho, I lived in Idaho, she lived in Georgia, North Georgia. And trying to ignore the little, things that were happening on our morning phone calls became, began to get harder and harder. Uh, repeated sentences and stories, imagining things that I couldn't believe were true, like somebody was coming into her house at night and moving her magazines around, or somebody had to come in and she was sure that they had hidden her quilts from her. Somebody was getting into her bank account and paying her bills for her. And that was just 
rattling her that somebody would have the nerve to do that. And I would make jokes and say, well, mom, I wish somebody would get into my bank account and pay my bills for me. And I knew, you know, I knew these things weren't normal, but she sounded normal. And we continued to have our daily talks and I could ignore it. And I could joke with my friends and say, yeah, I think my mom's, you know, my mom's getting old. She's repeating herself. And this is what my mom said today. And, you know, I could laugh about it. But what ended up happening was uh, the early morning phone call from the sheriff and uh, telling me that he'd been getting reports that she was driving on the wrong side of the road and erratically and that it, I needed to do something. Even then, as eye opening as that was for me, I was able to kind of put it off onto him and say, you're the sheriff, you're 3000 miles away from me, do something, you know, pull her over, give her a ticket, take her driver's license away from her. And then I got the phone call from the Department of Health and Family Services. <laughs> was the nurse that had been assigned to my mother's case because she had ended up in the hospital because she hadn't been taking her medication, her diabetes medication correctly. And her sugar levels were so far off that she missed a hairdressing appointment and they went and looked for her, brought her to the hospital. And when they stabilized her, she couldn't remember who to give them a name for to, to bring her home. Okay. So they sent her home with a nurse and that nurse, once she let herself into my mother's house was appalled at my mother's living conditions and found my phone number on my mother's refrigerator and called me to report back. And she, she was just um, livid. And I was shocked. I visited my mom once a year. I spoke with her on the phone every morning. And to hear this woman tell me that she was punching holes in the bottoms of chicken broth cans and living in the dark and the state of affairs of her house. It was all a shock to me. And then she ended the conversation with, and if you don't do something about it, the state will. I had no idea what that meant. What was the state going to do? But I called my sister, we made a plan. We went down to Georgia and we began the process of moving my mother to Idaho to be closer to me. Wow. Yeah, wow. That is so much to take in in a relatively short amount of time getting that phone call, initially getting the phone call from the sheriff, pulling your mother over, but then getting the call from the nurse about your mom being, uh, yeah. I can't, all the, all the while trying to make sense of it in my own mind and ignore it and rationalize it and put it off and just, and not wanting to really identify that something was happening to my mom. Wow. So yeah. now the process of getting her from Georgia to Idaho, that must have been very traumatic, not only for yourself, but for your mom as well. It was monumental. It, it involved a 26 foot U-Haul trailer and uh, my sister coming down to Georgia and meeting, uh, meeting my, at the time, my boyfriend and I, uh, meeting us in North Carolina and driving the rest of the way to my mom's house and surprising her and putting her in the car the very next day with my sister to go back home to New York so that we could clear out her house and get it ready for sale. And then my sister and my mother would fly from New York to Idaho where I would pick them up and bring them to my mother's new house that we had just outfitted with the items in that 26 foot U-Haul trailer, the things that made the cut. The things that made the cut, was your mom a part of that? <laughs> no, my mother, it, it was discovered was quite a hoarder. And for me to say that now and have somebody hear me, I, I can hear how that must sound because, well, why didn't you know, Carolyn? How did you not see this? You were visiting her, you know, once a year. But what was really happening was it was escalating. So the last time I was there, my mother's housekeeping habits were poor for sure, but they weren't to the state where they were when we dropped in on her to go get her. It was like she went over the hill and just downward spiraled quite quickly. And that was when, uh, that was when we were pretty much smacked in the face with the, the, the truth and the facts that there was something going on with mom. Wow. Now, did she stay in that home 
in Idaho? Or was there a point where you felt like she needed like full-time care, like maybe had to go into a facility or something? Yeah, it didn't take long. I had bought a house a little, just the cutest little house on a street, right up from the street from me, so that I could drop in on her. I had three meals a day with her and saw her on, on the street, sometimes walking down the hill. And that lasted all of six months. What I didn't realize was the extent of dementia that she was experiencing. It was the early stages, but there are several stages that lead up to the time where they're really starting to imagine things. And my mother was just getting there. So I had the difficulty of having this half of the time uh, mom who sounded normal. And then the other half of the time she was acting erratically, speaking erratically, and it was all mixed in just enough to keep. Oh. Carolyn, if you can hear me, we went, uh, you froze up a little bit. Okay. Okay, can now there you're back. Okay. I'm, you never know with modern technology. No. Well, the six months that my mom was in the house, as it got worse, she started um, stealing her neighbor's mail, burning it on her coffee table because she was sure that they were spying on, on her. She he started a night and going out on walks. She let a man camp in her backyard that she had met up at the gas station. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I had to start looking for alternative living for her. So as you're, and that's just, that must have been so hard, not only for yourself, but your other siblings as well. So you had mentioned in your bio that you had started to take notes, which became the basis of your book. When you pick your book up, or let me back up a little bit, when you first realized that all this was going on and you're making these notes, what is one thing that stuck out to you? Like perhaps it was an entry every day or something, those mo bursts of moments where maybe you had your mom, the mom that you knew. What, what, what did it for me was, I was um, emailing quite a bit back and forth with um, a couple of girlfriends, sharing stories with them and I was saving them. And then I had started writing down a couple of instances like, like the man who was camping in her backyard. That really was the eye opener. And I think when I went back and I reread some of the notes, let me also say that I had been going to the library looking for a book. I, I was drowning and I needed help and I didn't know who to turn to. I had nobody that had experienced dementia with a loved one. So I started looking for help in books. This was 2012. So the internet was there, but it wasn't something that I used regularly or, or had easy access to. So the library was my choice. And I was finding books, but I was finding books that had so much medical jargon in them about advanced stages of dementia. I read the 36 hour day, which is, you know, like the Bible for, for anybody who needs to read about dementia. But even there, they had very um, advanced situations, you know, where the dementia had progressed to a point where, you know, so-and-so didn't recognize their daughter. My mother recognized me. My mother knew my name, but she was, like I said, just off enough or into the stages enough that she could do the most troublesome things. She climbed up into her, her cherry tree one evening. And when I went to have dinner with her, I couldn't find her because she was so far up into the tree. It didn't even occur to me to look up that far. And I had to get her down and she refused. So those were the kinds of things that I didn't have any experience with and I didn't know how to handle them. And screaming at your mother to get down from the cherry tree isn't going to get her down <laughs> right because they they don't know they think that what they're doing is okay so it's it's not that they can't it's that they don't understand I absolutely think. she just wanted to pick cherries and she couldn't 
you know, she picked the ones that she could reach. So she wanted to go up higher where the better ones were. And how dare I tell her to come down? Right. Because probably, and again, I am no expert on this, but I'm thinking maybe the state that she was in, she's like, screw this. I'm getting the cherries, whether you, you know, like it or not. But that and was I was already, I was already the bad daughter who had moved her out of her home. I had taken her car away from her. And in her mind, I had, you know, bad intentions. I, I wanted to steal from her. She truly believed that. And there were times where she would pummel me with that accusations and disappointment in me. And, and, and I was hearing this from the mother that I loved. So it didn't matter how many times I told myself that this was the dementia speaking, it was coming from my mother. And I, I took it that way. It, it was devastating. I can't even begin to imagine because what you said there is so true. Those words were coming from your mom. And she meant every word as she was saying them. Mm. She truly felt that I was betraying her. She truly felt that I was taking her independence from her, that I had uprooted her from everything she knew and put her in this foreign environment for no reason at all. And that angered her. And you know, if you put the shoe on the other foot, wouldn't you be? Absolutely. And I'm thinking too, your response, obviously, please correct me if I'm wrong, may or may have not at that point in time been the optimal optimal moment to say mom you have a progressive disease or you know to try to explain it in a way that she would understand it because I think at that stage too they know what they're doing but they don't know what they're doing because they don't know how to process those emotions or those their feelings to explain why she is that upset. Although you said that she very, very detail oriented said, well, you did this, this, and this. It was mind boggling the things she could latch onto and, and notice and remember versus the things she couldn't, how she couldn't process common things and rational ideas. Yet she could decide that something was happening and fixate on it and be convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that her daughter was stealing from her. Her daughter stole her car, like I said. So when she's, you know, when she's hurling these accusations at me, I, I, I wanted to say, no, mom, I didn't do that. Uh, no, I'm not stealing from you. And how, and how can you say that to me? I'm taking care of you. Those were the early days of my mistakes. And I've learned since then. And that's why, that's why I wrote this book how to respond and how not to respond. And the average person who has no experience with dementia, first thing we want to do is justify our actions. We want to rationalize it out of them and explain it away. And we also want to say, mom, you have, you have dementia and I'm trying to take care of you. Huge mistake. The average person who comes down, who has dementia, doesn't realize that they have it. So telling them that they do is an assault on their character and they think that you're up to something that you're lying to them wow yeah it's like living in an alternate world and you have to put yourself in there when it goes against everything that you know against the grain in, in such a way so looking back at what you said in that moment of time um and as you mentioned we respond with justifying our actions, what do you think how you could have said it differently or continued the conversation, but in a such, such a way as not to justify your actions, but acknowledging how she feels? How I learned to do it was distraction and they, there's a name for it, therapeutic fibbing. <laughs> so my, my mother would meet me at the door in the morning and she would say, I know you were here last night and I know you took all of my prize winning quilts. 
Well, the first thing I would say is, mom, no, I didn't. I, I wasn't here last night. I, I didn't take anything. And I can't believe this is what you're saying to me the first thing I walk into the door. And then I learned to say, you know what? Let's go take a look for those quilts right now. I'm going to try and help you find them. I didn't, I didn't respond to the fact that she just told me I had broken in. I breezed right past that. And I went right to the point that she was trying to make, that she was distressed most about. And, and that's one of the things that is so helpful when you're dealing with somebody with dementia is try to put yourself into their life that moment and identify what's distressing them the most and see if you can't help them with that and not talk about the accusation they just hurled at you. So in with that, in with that hurling motion, and as you continue to go down this path, walking with Faye, there must have been a lot of emotions for you, aside from obviously your mom's well being. What was that like for you as she further progressed? I can tell you it was almost like a bell curve. In the beginning, you're climbing up and you're experiencing these things and you're starting to admit it to yourself and you can't deny it any longer. And then you go across the top of the bell, the, air, the times where you're just, you're putting out fires left and right and it is, it's terrible. And that lasted for years, unfortunately. Then you start to go down the backside of the bell curve and it kind of goes quickly again, but that's when, for me, my mother progressed a little bit further and faster in the stages of dementia. And that was when she recognized me less and less, was less physically active, less. Carolyn, we, you froze up again. How about now? Okay, you're good now. You're good now. Yeah, your phone was going in and out a little bit. Was I talking about the bell curve? Yes, it was about going down the downward backside. And right. you mentioned that it goes very quickly and further and faster. It did. It did for me. I think, I think everybody's going to experience it differently. But I also am going to say that there is, there is a textbook, you know, kind of a basis, a foundation that... Uh, People can pretty much compare each other's situations and say, yeah, that happened to me too, with this variation, you know, or that variation. Um, I remember in my Alzheimer's Association meetings, they told me that this was going to happen. And they said, you know, it's going to be easier as it gets further along. And as it did get further along and my mother stopped recognizing me, I had so many people say, oh, that must be terrible for you. you your mother doesn't even recognize her own daughter. And I said, no it's so much better for me now because now I'm just this nice lady who comes to visit her and she greets me with a smile and I hand her a peach or I bring her a bakery cookie and she's happy and I have a pleasant hour long visit with her when before I was just this terrible daughter who disappointed her, who was up to something, who was taking away her freedoms. Wow. Uh Sometimes I don't know what to say. <laughs> and not only was it the down curve for your mom, but I feel you kind of going up the other side of the bell ahead of her. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I guess I mean that in a way that th th I can't even imagine what it, what it was like going to your mom's house every day and her not recognizing you and her, like you said, throwing the accusations at you. But now you had the opportunity to share something with your mother that was good, was wholesome. And she recognized you as that beautiful young lady who came to visit her. Well, a stranger. A stranger. <laughs> but it's poetic in nature, I think. Yeah. Th those early stages were honestly horrific. Um, 
it, so so it was a breath of fresh air it was a relief to to get closer to the end now that's not to say there weren't other things you know my mother was not easy throughout the whole thing she was confused often and it was hard to get her to eat and it was hard to keep her engaged. So every time I went and I, and I did have to put her in an assisted living facility, actually she went through four because mm-hmm. as she graduated, she became more and more difficult, which is another common thing. She was wandering into residence rooms and she was identifying things of theirs that she was convinced were hers. Oh, so nice. she was taking them and bringing them back to her room. So we had to move her yet again to another place. And finally, she ended up in um, a memory care facility that was just perfect because they had just the right amount of staff for the number of uh, ladies that they had in their wing. So mom was never left alone for very long. She was always being uh, talked to and chatted with, and it just kind of kept her, kept her busy. And that was really good for her in the end. Wow. Now, as it got near to the time where unfortunately your mom passed away, what is it, what would you say would be the one thing that you felt in your heart that you know you did absolutely the right thing? Because I think a lot of times when when we have our loved ones, especially our parents in such a situation like that, we often look back and think, oh my God, you know, what could we have done better? What do you think sticks out for you? The one thing that I did the best, I've got lots of things that I didn't do quite the best, but the thing that I did the best and the advice that I would give to anybody that I'm talking to now was that I showed up. I didn't leave her alone. I, I was like a glutton for punishment. And I had so many people say, oh my gosh, Carolyn, how do you just keep going back to this? Mm -hmm. But I did because I realized so far later, so much later that when my mother was at her worst toward me, it was when she was at her most frightened and her most confused. And she was lashing out trying to gain back a little bit of the power, I think, that had been taken away from her. She had lost everything. She couldn't get in her car and drive to the grocery store if she wanted. And she remembered those days. Mm -hmm. So I think that my, my best thing I did was I showed up. I didn't give up, even though there were days that I did not want to knock on that door and see what was going to greet me on the other side. Wow. You showed up in such a way you honored your mom's relationship, but you also honored yourself by showing up every day. Now, obviously the book comes along in, or the idea of writing the book comes along and you said you document, documented everything so well, whether it was emails or whatnot, when you actually sat down to write your book, what was that feeling inside of you like? I can't tell you how many times I would just burst out in tears and then followed by laughter. I would, I would just be going through a, a chapter and just crack up at something that my mother had done, some situation we had gotten ourselves into, and then right behind it, burst into tears because there was something equally tragic that happened. And, and that is the life of a caregiver somebody who's caring for a loved one with dementia, that is what they're going to be going through, which was the whole reason I wrote the book because I was going through it and I was pinch hitting and I had nothing to base it on. And I was having the hardest time giving myself a break and knowing what to say next. I would, I would break out in a sweat because I was so afraid my mother was going to ask me something and I wasn't going to know how to, how to answer it without getting a terrible reaction from her. Wow. So you write this book and as you're going through it, as you said, sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry, but there was a deeper purpose for you writing this book. Obviously you wanted to share 
because a lot of times they say we don't know what we don't know and a lot of people that are experiencing this or going through it with their loved ones are like okay what do i do now uh, obviously there is the alzheimer's association as you mentioned i would imagine they would have and i don't know this i would imagine they would have uh, support groups and whatnot to support families. They do in, in some towns. It depends on the size of your town. My town is 2,500 people. It, it, was, it was what we had at the time. And now, oh my gosh, now there's the internet. And there are wonderful, wonderful groups on the internet, which I look at now just because I'm involved, you know, with my book and, and things. So there are plenty of places that you can go including books. And, and this was the book that was going to, I think it was meant to give that everyday experience to the average person. It's not written by a celebrity. It's, it doesn't talk about help that somebody paid for. This is, this is real in the trenches kind of story. It's written like a novel. So it's perfect for somebody who likes to read. It's a mother daughter relationship book. But at the same time, it also teaches so much. Like you don't always have to be right. You know, ask yourself, what's the, the end result you want from this interaction you're having with this person, whether it's a loved, loved one with dementia or a spouse or your best friend that's being difficult today. It's that kind of a well-rounded message that so many people will benefit from. That is amazing to give the everyday experience to anyone who may be going through this, anyone who's listening to this right now, that will certainly resonate with them. Where can our viewers and listeners get in contact with you? And where can they purchase your book? Uh, I have a website. It's my full name. It's carolynburel.com. And if you type in walking with Faye, just in your search, you know, your Google search bar, it, uh, all the places online will show up where you can buy my book. It's on Amazon. Um, I've, I've got 89 reviews already since Mother's Day when it debuted. So I'm really happy with that. And um, Barnes and Noble and Books A Million, anywhere you buy books. That's amazing. Um, and congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the stories that inspire, especially in a time where we need those inspiring st stories for those who have loved ones going through this dementia process, which is an awful disease, not only for the person, but for the caregiver. And, oh my gosh, Carolyn, I can't thank you enough for being my special guest today on Stories That Inspire Us. Thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. You know, everyone, I know that you know, if you can hear my voice, if you're listening to this video, wherever you listen to the podcast, you probably know someone who is experiencing this awful disease. Know that you are not alone. You are the caregiver. You're probably going through so much right now. Get Carolyn's book, connect with her through her website and have that inspiration. You have a story to tell. Your story needs to be told. I am the host of Stories That Inspire Us today. I was inspired by this amazing lady, Carolyn. Thank you so much, everyone. And if you know somebody who has an inspiring story, please go to my website and register as a guest. We hope you have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Bye for now.